My story begins in the Caravanios bus station in San Jose. I arrived an hour and a half early for my 10.30 bus, having caved to the strange urgency of my host mom's increasingly less comical requests that I hurry up and leave so she could throw a party in my absence. <laughs> I pretended to read, but looked up from the book every 15 seconds or so. There were a fair amount of tourists at the station, and my sizable suitcase made me slow and inflated in the eyes of a potential thief. I purchased my ticket and boarded the bus to Cariari a short while later. After three hours in a Daewoo bus with inoperable windows and suspect emergency exits, I arrived in Cariari hot, dehydrated, and sore. So when a man in his mid-twenties handed me a blue Powerade and offered a free ride in his worn white pickup, I couldn't refuse. <laughs> Much to my parents' assumed relief, that man turned out to be my rural host brother, Bernie. We spoke very little during the first few minutes of the trip, but he became visibly and verbally more relaxed as I slowly proved to him that I did in fact speak some Spanish. He told me that we were headed towards a group of farms known as Las Colinas and started listing off his family for me. Don Carlos and Doña Nuria ran the farm, and his brothers, Carlosito and Kaler, assisted them. As he spoke, the soft rumbling of the road beneath us became more pronounced as we transitioned from asphalt to gravel. It was not until the tires had spewed the last few bits of grayscale dome behind us, however, that my expression betrayed me. The next 12 kilometers are like this, Bernie said with a sheepish grin. I took a deep breath. What lay before me was not a road. Miles of mud had been cut from the forested landscape to make a one-and-a-half lane engineering nightmare. But as if for some fear that its sizable ruts and ditches would not suffice, the passage's cruel architect had sunk football-sized boulders deep into the dirt for added stability. <laughs> the pickup creaked and moaned for eight long miles, with Bernie being forced to downshift as we exited one pit, only to fall into another. When we finally arrived at the farm, I leapt from the truck with genuine enthusiasm. Our 45-minute trek had left me with a pounding headache that would last for almost two days, and a rectangular bruise across my right shoulder that would fade soon after that. Doña Nuria rushed to the side of the truck and offered to help with my suitcase. She welcomed me to my new home and gave me the grand tour. My program director had told us that every one of our real estate families had running water and electricity. Neither one of these things was entirely true in my case. <laughs> a gas power generator in the back of the house pumped water into a tank on the roof, and gravity created the pressure necessary to provide the illusion of running water when you turn the spigot. The same generator also charged a few car batteries that created a less convincing illusion of electricity. They provided enough power to run the few compact fluorescents that dotted the ceiling, and gave the family the option of watching a football match in very limited installments. I explored the house for a few minutes with the flashlight they had given me before Doña Nuria called me to dinner. The meal consisted of a variety of tubers floating in a thin broth. Doña Nuria proudly explained that every item in the bowl was something they cultivated on the farm. She rattled them off every time I brought the spoon to my mouth. There were pieces of malanga, potato, <laughs> camote, potato, <laughs> yuca, potato, and yame potato. She told me I would come to know them apart soon enough and retired to bed, leaving me to find a place to put my dirty dishes with only the guidance of three LEDs. I spent the rest of the night marinating in my own sweat beneath a mosquito net. It was a baptism by 80 degree heat and 90 percent humidity. I didn't sleep so much as deliriously claw at my sheets and beg for it to rain in a half sob. My host family would later tell me that it had been unusually warm during my stay, even by coastal standards. Their assertion did little to mollify the dark pools of flesh that gathered under my eyes, or the fact that my whole body felt like I had spent the night playing in a slip and slide lined with Crisco. <laughs> the next day was exhaustingly tame. I had gotten my wisdom teeth out less than a week before, and Doña Nuria decided I should stay out of the sun until I had finished my cycle of antibiotics. On a farm in Las Colinas, that means only one thing, cleaning eggs. Armed with only a scouring pad and a strip of damp, grungy t-shirt, I managed to lift the poop and bedding off of more than 700 eggs in three hours. With no other task to consume my time, however, the largest portion of the day was dedicated to actually reading the book I had neglected at the bus station and waiting for dinner. When that much-anticipated meal turned out to be fried malanga, my emotional integrity started to collapse. How the hell would I survive this trip on only potatoes in free time? I withdrew further into my sweaty shell and isolated myself from the rest of the family. It was Doña Nuria who first paddled over to my psychological island, either out of ignorance or intuition. She placed a glass of mysterious beige liquid next to me and promptly left the room. I took a cautious sip and found it had an agreeable taste, similar to hot eggnog. 
I was already feeling better when Dona Nuria returned with a bottle of imported rum and a teaspoon. I've found that this improves the taste, she said with a <laughs> wink before le leaving the room once more. I can't say with complete certainty why my whole outlook on the trip changed that night. <laughs> Perhaps it was the fact that the heat began to retire with the sun as cool rains moved over the farm. It might have been the cliché country air cleaning out the pollutants I carried with me from San Jose. Or maybe it was the fact that I neglected to use the teaspoon as a measuring device. <laughs> Instead, I opted to add rum to my drink in a ratio that most certainly did not improve the taste. <laughs> Whatever came to pass, the metamorphosis was deep and lasting. I could continue to describe the various hardships I played, that plagued my trip. I could write about my discovery that there are at least two species of ants and one species of beetle small enough to fit through a mosquito net. I could share the macabre details of the ten minutes it takes a calf to succumb to having its veins open to the air. However, doing so would betray my transformation in a negligent and miserly act. It would not only be unfair to burden everyone with my difficulties, but easy well. How can I expect anyone to genuinely comprehend my journey if I still obscure and distort the harmony between my fitful first few days and the extraordinary weeks that follow? The possibility of doing so stems from my own shortcomings as a writer. It's always been somewhat of a curse that venom flows so easily from my pen as it exacerbates my already crippling incompetence of describing the ambrosial. There are no words for the hard-earned love that I gained through the land after planting nearly three acres of camote shoulder to shoulder with two Nicaraguan workers. My tongue can t touched my palate and remember tasting the stubbly flesh of the 25-pound jungle rat known as the Tepes Queenling, but it cannot transform the meal into words. I can tell you about how the sun never really set so much as bled into darkness, but you will not visualize the clouds leaching the light from the sky as I do. Adjectives cannot carry you crests and curves of the soft green hills where I spent my October. And yet as selfish as it is, I need no words to preserve my experience. Every time a warm breeze cuts through the stale air, my mind returns to that place of sweat and tranquility whose beauty could not escape me and language could not touch. Thank you. <laughs>